As you all know, I'm Andrew Cohen. I direct the Gene Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics here at Georgia State University. I also teach in the philosophy department. And we are delighted to have today's event as part of a series of events leading up to the celebration of Veterans Day 2017. We're going to be screening a movie in a moment that documents some of the hardships that people who serve our country face, both when they serve and after they return home. There is a lot to celebrate in people who serve our country, the honor and resilience that they show. And as I mentioned at an event earlier today, the gratitude that civilians show to returning warriors is certainly well-intentioned, but it may miss a lot of what it is that uh, people have gone through. A lot of people who serve are troubled by the remark, thank you for your service, because they think that sometimes the thank you is perhaps not reaching into the depth of what it is that they may have actually gone through when they served. And many of the people who did serve our country are dealing with certain things. Some people refer to them as invisible wounds. And the documentary that we'll screen tonight is going to talk a little bit about those types of wounds. Some of them are grief for fallen comrades. Some is guilt and shame for having done or not done something that they thought that they ought to have done. But we must not forget the virtues and the strengths that our service members show. Some of it they are trained to develop, and some of it they just have because they're decent human beings even before they went into military service. So this movie is going to document a few particularly moving and difficult cases, and afterwards we'll have a conversation among our distinguished panelists about some of the themes in the film. And the film is 90 minutes, so we can run with it. Uh, talk with our, with our panelists here, and you can read about their biographies in the brochure that we've been handing out. We've got Mark Aster, Sarah Cook, Maria Britt, Nick Irving, and Rich Glickstein. And they each bring uh, a variety of experiences and expertise Many of our distinguished panelists have served our country. So this film talks about a bunch of themes. What we thought we would do is just generate a conversation among the panelists and with, with y'all. And the film talks about a lot of the issues about what people might not know and what they might need to know about the challenges of reintegrating. Uh, why don't we start with some concrete issues and we can run with that. Uh, Training, a lot of the military training and how it prepares people for uh, all aspects of combat. I'm wondering if uh, y'all think that there's something that the military can do to better train people for some of the struggles that was being depicted in the film. Uh, anything that y'all might want to offer about that? Yeah, let me take it. Sure, go ahead. I would, yeah, Rangers lead the way. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. But, um, yeah, I would say training has a lot, or uh, I guess a big, or the common denominator when it comes to, uh, I guess, a lot of the issues that veterans face when they do get out. You know, 99% uh, of my job going into the military was very specific, and that was to do one thing and one thing only. It wasn't there to win hearts and minds. It wasn't there to go shake hands in the daytime and pass out candy. It was specifically to uh, provide overwatch and take out targets as need be. And I got really good at uh over time, and I started deploying when I was 18 years old. I enlisted when I was 17, and uh, started with the class of 85 students, around 85, and we graduated seven. And from those seven, we went into our special operations uh, units and started deploying. I had six combat deployments, and there's only been one deployment where I have never shot someone. Um, I was averaging you know, 10 to 15 at least, and then, of course, the last one, I uh, racked 33 um, with unknown probables. But, one of our models in the sniper community is without warning and without remorse. So you learn to shut off that remorseful feeling. And that was one of the big challenges that I had, uh, you know, coming back from a mission or after taking out a target was I did have that remorseful feeling, but I knew that it was against our creed and our, 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 our motto. So it was an internal battle for me to really, you know, figure out you know, how to suppress that remorseful feeling. So uh, it built up over time, built up over time, and I never had that training to, okay, well, now there is remorse. That never got, you know, turned back on. Or 
it was never uh, told to, or you never really told to speak about it. So getting out, I suppressed that for some time and attempted suicide twice and was a into, not into, but uh, cutting was one of my, uh, was one of my things to, I guess, feel that pain that I uh, left overseas. And you know, I spilled blood over there and I've, I've tasted my best friend's blood, have their names tattooed on me. And that was my, I guess, my release and I never got a chance to from the military getting out that decompression or how to, I guess, cope with the, um, the struggles of combat. Not necessarily even combat. Uh, the killing aspect never really got to me. It was the, the loss of life and the, 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 grief, the grieving stage and the, the stage of what if I could have been a second faster or what if I would have not led my team to the right or what if, you know, all types of things like that. And I had a really big internal battle with that. And uh, it's one of those things that's not talked about in the military. And we're told to, you know, drink a beer, chug it, you know, fit the jack, and you'll be good to go. And that became a really bad habit to the point where I was uh, in the military. Our training, when we got back from a deployment, 24 hours, we're downtown Atlanta, and I'm chugging, you know, 30 beers and a fit the jack just to go to sleep. And that went over the course of some time to the point where uh, started to eat up a lot of, personal time, finances, and lost my car from it. I uh, had a foreclosure notice on my home, and I didn't even have a care in the world. So the only way I knew how to fight that battle from, from the military or how to fight any battle was to kill it. So the battle that I had, uh, that I saw immediately in front of me was myself, and uh, I had to kill it. So luckily it didn't happen, but that was one of the biggest wars and hardest you know, battles I had to ever fight was, uh, I guess, shooting at something or attempting to destroy something that I couldn't even see, and that... And when I did look at it, it was usually looking back at me in the mirror. Well, and if I can just not add mm -hmm. to your experience, but something, you know, as a, a commander of the, the Army National Guard here in Georgia, that we did know our soldiers were going to be dealing with difficult situations. And the Army came up with a program called Yellow Ribbon to, to help create some of that resiliency. I, you know, I, it, it was a faulted program, and it didn't do all that it, it should have done, but it, it was an attempt to do that, and not just for the service members, but for the family, especially the spouses, because they had to understand those warning signs, and they had to know, hey, and, and you saw it in the film, something's not right, he's not processing well. So we were doing the training when the troops came back from deployment, and I had a soldier come up to me and, and say, ma'am, why don't we do this training at the beginning had we done training at the beginning, I wouldn't be dealing with communication problems and probably a future divorce. So we actually found the funding to do the training on the front end and the back end with a little bit different um, take on the back side because they had gone through the deployment. So it, it, it was a, a, spouses told me it saved lives. We also increased our, our chaplaincy to try to deal with the, the trauma and the, the crisis calls that we would get for soldiers that were hauled up in the garage with a gun, drinking too much, uh, spouse abuse just uh, exponentially increased when these soldiers came home. So the, the training piece, you know, we, we can train them to be soldiers, but it's dealing with the aftermath and what, what we're asking them to do. This whole moral injury concept was uh, something when Andrew explained it to me that just resonated. So it's... I think we need to do better as a military to continue to, to educate not just the soldiers but the family members on what to what to expect and what this does. It's real. Yeah. What, what sort of differences do you all spot between what we commonly call uh, PTSD and what they're talking about in the film, which they call moral injury? The differences? Yeah. But why might these matter? For me, I would classify, I guess, or look at PTSD as, as uh, being used to operating in a very chaotic environment. And that was what my norm was. That is where I felt comfortable. You know, getting shot at and you know, I've done over 556 some odd special operations missions and have been shot over, uh, shot at over a, thousand, a few thousand times. And that was where I felt, you know, extremely comfortable. Getting home to pay bills and late payments and stuff like that, I had no idea of, you know, how to deal with that stress. Um, the chaos in combat became my, I guess, my safe haven, my safe spot. And uh, the day-to-day -day struggles that the average person goes through, I didn't know, you know, I guess necessarily know how to deal with. And 
that's when I knew how to, or I went back to only one way of thinking, and I think that's my classification of PTSD, is just operating in a, being calm in a chaotic environment, and the, when you're at home and the, the calm environment becomes my chaotic environment, I'm not used to dealing with that calmness. It becomes so calm to the point to where it's almost becoming chaotic. And I'm not tra I wasn't trained to, or I didn't know how to reevaluate and look at myself to, you know, to deal with that type of stress. So I would crave to go back overseas, and a lot of the guys did. I guess what I would say from a psychological standpoint uh, is having studied post-traumatic stress, and not in veterans, um, but in women who've been victims of violence, is that um, you know, it, it encompasses a number of, of symptoms, you know, about three or four clusters of symptoms, depending on how you think about it, numbing and avoidance, um, hypervigilance, or you know, in a you know, being in a constant state of arousal. Um, it doesn't speak to the guilt and the shame. Uh, and I, I was trying to think of the three on the in the Venn, in the Venn diagram. There were guilt, shame, and there was another one that like I, I can't remember. What was that? Fear. Fear or anger. Oh, anger. 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 I was going to say fear would definitely be in, in the PTSD, but anger. Yeah, and anger and fear. Mm, tough to tease apart, I think sometimes, but. Um, that guilt and shame are, I mean, shame is such a deep emotion um, that is felt by, um, you know, when I think about um, the defining aspects of abuse, it's shame and, uh, and, tr and tremendous guilt for what, what have I done to cause this. And as someone who hasn't studied veterans, I was amazed at the um, similarities in thinking about abuse. I mean, what is that? Misuse. Misuse of a person, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And um, so, as someone said, wh what kind of a God allows people to do this to, to one another? Um, it is a misuse of humanity. Um, and so, um, thinking about that guilt and shame and how that is a, a hallmark of other um, instances where people find themselves doing things or not doing things um, to survive was um, uh, something I had not put together in that way before. And I don't know if any of that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. Um, it was um, profound for me. I, I, th I think what's interesting about um, emotional process, and, and it actually goes back to the first question that you asked, is that in order to be a good service member, be a good soldier or Marine, one ought to turn off these emotions of compassion and care and 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 uh, shame because shame begat uh, uh, you know, from shame we can get empathy from empathy we can get shame. But I, ironically, it's those things and those emotions that actually make a good service member. That be, because the idea. Um, is to protect those that cannot be protect, protected or cannot protect themselves. The idea is um, to threaten violence to secure peace. And and this just this, this irony is just such that it, this really interesting irony um, that um, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember is Stephen Dwyer I think is his name uh, the medic in one of the. Um, uh, early photographs in 2003, um, who ended up um, uh, dying from um, uh, from an inhalant death uh, after doing inhalants and whatnot, um, had this, this beautiful compassion of caring for this this young Iraqi boy who was on the battlefield and had, you know, he, he needed to be cared for, right? And so here's this medic to care for him. So when those things come out, and this goes back to the training, when those things come out, it is okay. It's important that it comes out. But now here we, we can get into also the, the difference between PTSD, which I think is not just emotional dysregulation, but also um, a physical change in the brain. Um, some neurochemicals and neurotransmitters get upregulated, some get downregulated. Um, but moral injury is a completely different animal. One we can diagnose, the other one, just because we have a moral injury, there is no diagnosis for it, but it can drive one, right? 
um, you know, with but without connection, without shame, without without fear, without um, uh, empathy, these things actually can't get helped. So, in a sense, I'm really glad you failed yeah. um, at ending your own life because by doing so, you succeeded. Yeah, me too. You know, I mean, I truly, truly yeah. am. Yeah. Um, you know, because it, we need service members who have been deployed to come and and make connections with people who who haven't. Um, because it, that's where the understanding comes in. Uh, because people need to see what happens in, in war to tr truly start to understand it. And it's just, it's very, very difficult without seeing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How important do, do you all think uh, having a, a purpose is for being able to succeed as a warrior and being able to uh, come back? Because they talked about that uh, during the film, that it seemed as though a lot of what they were, were doing seemed purposeless, pointless. Uh, they were beginning to ask, why, why are we here? What are we doing here? The, the, the justification for, for being deployed there seemed to be changing daily. And after a while, they said, it doesn't really seem like we're, we're here for any particular reason. Is that expendable, or does that, does that strike you all as being important? Um, I th Pardon me if, I, if you guys don't mind if I just jump in for a moment. Um, purpose, I think, is, is not just important, it's the centerpiece um, for the service member because the indoctrinating idea is we are serving for a reason and there needs to be a reason to do something. And so when, when that part of the film was coming out, the, word, the words I wrote down were mission creep. And mission creep is, is just this meandering of ideas of what are we doing? And there's there's this there's no bedrock of purpose there. You know, it's it's the purpose of of anything that a service member or a veteran will do, um, whether in uniform, out of uniform, or you know, or, or not. There there has to be a purpose. I think is. Well, I think part of that's tied to the mission of why you're there. Mm -hmm. So you know, to win the hearts and minds, you heard that several times, mm -hmm. but they didn't feel like they were really winning the hearts and minds by their actions. So you do need that purpose. It, it drives you in peacetime and in wartime. It, it's not just a, a, a combat issue. You need to have purpose for putting on the uniform. And, and for me, it was to, to be a deterrent to bullies and to tyrants mm -hmm. by having a strong military. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's got to be a purpose greater than yourself for the greater good. Yeah, I can relate to somewhat to what they were saying in the movie. Um, I guess winning the hearts and minds, that was never our mission set. That was more on the conventional side of winning the hearts and minds. Um, our motto was we'd win it one bullet at a time, you know, with one in the heart and one in the mind. Um, that was ours. <laughs> I think that, you know, over time, and they mentioned uh, Helmand Province, a place where I was deployed, um, in 2009 it was a Taliban safe haven. And I understood that purpose, you know, regardless of what the news put out, but a lot of that, that, that four-month deployment of what we did in those four months was, you know, it's only just now coming out. No one knew about the missions we were doing before the Marines went in, and uh, it was a big, you know, push to clear out that, that you know, Taliban safe haven. Uh, before the Marines had went in, our whole job was to go in there and eliminate as many as we possibly could. That was my purpose, and that was my mission, and, and I think that's what uh, a lot of the guys, we were, you know, we were glad to wake up and, and go out and get shot at 50 times in a night because we were, you know, doing bad things to bad people, essentially. And I think every once in a while that does need to occur. There, there's, a, there's a time and a season for, for violence, there's a you know, time and a season for peace, and um, that was a time for war, and uh, we were, you know, proud of what we'd done. And I think that the, us killing however many few hundred guys we killed, I think, you know, it, I hope it would have saved uh, a Marine's life somewhere down the line. I know for a fact that you know the guys that we did eliminate were you know hardcore, uh, some of the top you know high value targets in in Afghanistan. So I had that purpose. You know that goes back to the military. They ingrain it in you early that you're you're apolitical. You know your civilian control of the military. You've got to believe that your civilian leaders are sending you into into combat for a reason. That there's a purpose, uh, a higher purpose. And I, I think, you know, then it translates down to the actual mission and completing the mission. But, you know, at, at my level, 
I want to believe that our commander in chief is doing the right thing for the right reason. Do, do y'all think that the the struggles that Tom and Anthony were dealing with in this film are, are these are these typical? If I'm a civilian, I, I see these films and I read about this, and I'm getting a lot of a lot of messages that uh, people are, are coming home and they've got lots of challenges. But I also get messages from other people who say, this isn't typical. Uh, a lot of people come home, they go straight back to their families and everything's fine. And we're making a mountain out of a molehill by focusing films on this. If I were driving down the highway and got hit by a Mack truck, I wouldn't drive the same way the next day. You know, and I think uh, war is a lot the same way or in that aspect that it, it will change you. I mean, you see things that the average person doesn't get a chance to see. You know, I was 18 years old and I came from a religious background of thou shall not kill. And my first operation out, I hit a guy with a 50 cal and turned him essentially to jelly. And I had a dream of a reoccurring dream that I still have of him. It's a ceiling fan and his arms are the blades and his legs are the blades with his head the centerpiece. And he's spinning and spinning and spinning and the faster he gets and the faster that blade spins or he spins, he starts to tear apart and spill his guts on me. So I think it does change you. Um, to take a life or to see a life taken or to be in that environment, a chaotic environment where it's kill or be killed, it, it has to, um, there is a change. Mentally, physically, you think you go back to your you know, primitive state. Um, you know, only the, 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 the strong survive, survival of the fittest, and the weak guys didn't make it. I'm not going to say weak, but um, you have to be a certain way to, to win that guerrilla type warfare. Mm -hmm. It's not a line up and load my musket and shoot the guy in front of me. It's a you know, I shake your hand one day, and the next day at the marketplace, you know, you're stabbing my PO with a, a knife or shooting him with an AK. So it does change you. It, do, it does take in a, a toll on, on you. It's like getting into an accident for years and years and years, for six months straight or a year straight, you know, uh, deployment-wise, and you're getting hit by this Mack truck or freight train, and then it just stops. And then you're told to go back 24 hours later and drive normal, you know. It doesn't work that way. You're, you've been hit too many times. You've been in one too many accidents. You know. yeah. Here at uh, Georgia State, it's a good example just because the school is so big. We have um, so many, so much subject matter. <laughs> There's so many veterans. Um, so after a certain number of years, David can attest to this, that, uh, of talking to veterans, particularly combat veterans, but it doesn't have to be, particularly combat um, vets, is that, yeah, there, there are some serious challenges Sometimes not as, usually not as serious as what the film depicts, but that's because veterans tend to not talk about it. So we, we know it's there. Every one of them has, every one of us coming out of the military are having to transition from a very structured environment to one of considerably less or no structure. You know, you're on your own. You've lost all your buddies, you've lost all, your, all your, your comrades, your colleagues, and you're thrust into this environment here, and that's where it starts to really come out that you're struggling or you're going to struggle. And then they come. They, they often come to us in the, in the military outreach centers on, on our campuses to say, you know, they don't say I'm a veteran. I need help. They say I'm failing math. I feel like a dummy. What's wrong with me? I can't focus. I can't concentrate. I can't write a paragraph. Like Nick can write. Some of them they can't write anymore. <laughs> it's like yeah. I used to be a good writer. What's wrong with me? And we start, you know, digging in, trying to gain their trust a little bit, and find out, you know, what's going on, and get get them some help. But um, I only had one deployment, and I didn't have. Uh, I wouldn't say I had PTSD from being shot at or anything like that. Um, my first real exposure into PTSD was right when I came into this job almost six years ago. I was talking to um, a soldier who was actually still in the, in the National Guard. He had deployed twice. And back to one of your earlier questions, Andrew, about um, the, the bleed over, or in this case it was bleed over, of uh, um, the moral injury versus PTSD, all of that was kind of combined with him because um, he was having some remorse for things he did, but consecutive deployments, his buddies got blown up on both sides of him, and he survived. So he felt like he, number one, failed them, didn't protect them. Number two, it should have been him and not his buddies. And so he's reliving this, reliving this, and, um, and after we've talked for a couple of times, I finally had to stop and say, what are you going to do about it? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Because that's what they teach us in the military, just be blunt about it, just ask them. And they won't be, people won't be offended if you ask them but they may be dead if you don't. It's the, way, it's, the way, it's the way we're trained. And he said, yes, sir, I am. And so well, we got the gun out of his house and all of that. Got him some help, and he ended up going around with me talking to other veterans once he got back to being an A student. 
So that was that was a, a VA success story. Can't say there's a whole lot of them. That was one. That was my first exposure to what PTSD really looked like, and it was after I'd gotten out of the military. After 21 years, that's when I actually started learning about it. And the military is maybe doing a little better job, but not doing a great job of preparing you for it before it becomes reality, your reality. Mm -hmm. Usually when it's too late, yeah. There, there yeah, are some there are some commanders out there that uh, so not to like automatically give you pushback, but I've seen a few, mm -hmm. a handful of, of COs out there that are really pro mental health. I mean, when I was in graduate school seven eight years ago or something, like the, there was one of the commanders that was in charge of the ranges in Fort Jackson, um, who was in con in command of all um, uh, combat veterans, everybody had something on the right on the right sleeve. And he was so such a proponent um, of seeking out mental health uh, help for his soldiers that he was in therapy. And he would regularly talk about it and say, you know, all right, you're coming with me. You're going to go see Miss So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so. Um, I'm going to introduce you because she's my therapist. That's great. Um, it's, unfortunately, it's rare. Yeah. Um, but they're, they are out there. They, they are absolutely out there. And, and to simply answer your question, yes. Um, I'm, I'm working with uh, one sailor right now, um, a gunner's mate who was an individual augmentee to several different uh, deployments, both in Central America and in the Middle East, um, who's, who's dealing with uh, survivor's guilt to this day um, from something that he experienced in 2005, 2006. Um, where he lost uh, two Marines and two sailors, and he carries that guilt around with him until, until just the session that I had with him this morning. Um, and so I handed him a, a, an assignment to try and to do, um, and he's like, I can't look at this. I'm like, well, you're going to do it anyway, um, because avoidance is PTSD's best friend, right? So if we continue to allow the avoidance, it's more nurturing the, the unfortunate, um, uh, the after effects, right? But if we address, kind of like the, uh, uh, Tom was talking about, Tom Voss was talking about, if we address, if we allow, if we don't judge, if we um, uh, allow things in, if we allow vulnerability, um, yes, of course, you know, we're, we're um, opening ourselves up to, to threat, but we're also opening ourselves up to healing, right? So, um, and th through that practice, Tom Voss got his life back, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's, I mean, every day. There's 28 to so, 28 to 30 percent, and this is 2008 numbers, um, 28 to 30 percent of people who deploy or are exposed to direct combat will have some sort of diagnosable PTSD, depression, anxiety, something. But the other 70 to 72 percent don't. It doesn't mean they don't experience something like that. Or it doesn't mean they don't, after a gradual re-entry, actually put whatever it is, not behind them, but at least to rest to some degree. And they can resume their lives. But they still have residual. You know, it's still there. And it seems, I'm Please sorry. Go ahead. Well, it seems to me we just can't paint everyone who has served as a, with a broad brush because mm -hmm. the experiences are so different. Mm -hmm. One group in the Vietnam War who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder um, were nurses because of their exposure to you know, the trauma. So uh, exposure has a lot to do with um, who's going to develop post-traumatic stress disorder or have post-traumatic stress symptoms, maybe not the full-blown disorder, but a lot of pre-functioning, how someone functions beforehand can be predictive of that. I mean, some some there are people who face incredibly traumatic experiences and don't ever develop post traumatic stress but i but i would say that they would still be capable not capable is not the right word vulnerable perhaps of of experiencing moral injury and so that for some people those circles may overlap and for some people those circles may be separate and um, so i i don't to, to get back to your original question I think there is huge, there's got to be huge variability in how people return, and when dis, I, don't, I hate to say dysfunction because it almost seems like to experience the post-traumatic stress would be the 
correct response to the stress you've been through. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there may s symptoms roll out also over time. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really know how someone is going to respond, um, maybe over some, some years, mm -hmm. some period of years. This, this type of, of moral injury is a type of uh, invisible wound, uh, a soul wound. Is it a disease? No, I wouldn't say it would be a disease. Um, but you can catch a disease, which is essentially what happens when you do you know, experience combat and you are scarred spiritually or morally or, you know. I think it's more of a contradiction. Yeah. You know, it contradicts what you're having to do versus your moral compass in your own soul, your own values as a, a human being or even faith practice. So it, it's a contradiction. It's military may demand of you things that you wouldn't morally agree with and that creates that conflict. Mm -hmm. Some people experience that conflict through uh, guilt and shame and others evade it. Maybe they, they avoid it in some way. Uh, did we see any any good strategies in this film about addressing that? For, I think it started with the veterans themselves, uh, self-acknowledging, uh, yeah. you know, their own issues. And it started with me essentially the same way. And one of the hardest conversations I ever had to have with anyone wasn't with a psychologist or anything like that. Um, it wasn't with a bottle of Jack. It was the guy, you know, who I passed in the, you know, the mirror every morning to the bathroom. Um, that was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had to, you know, have was talk to that guy and say, hey, who are you? You know, you know, what is your purpose now? I uh, made it from, you know, the sixth grade is when I wanted to become a sniper, and I finally achieved that goal. And at the recruiting office, I wanted uh, initially a 20-year contract, and I'm, I'm so thankful that recruiter did not do that. <laughs> um, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. Oh, I, I asked for that. And I was like, this is what I want to do. This is life for me. And... I'm not smart enough to do anything else. I just had that, you know, I was told that for my entire life that I wasn't, I couldn't do that because I was, you know, academically not a straight A student or something. And military was all I had. And after military life, you know, I took its toll, I picked up contracting. It was all I knew how to do was kick in doors and, and, and do my job. But um, having that conversation with the guy in the mirror was, I guess extremely eye-opening and refining that that new goal in life, that new push of that new driver, something to want to go after. You know, I spent my entire life wanting to to be a sniper and spec ops guy. That I, I didn't have any goal after that, so it was hard to rekindle that that flame, that fire of you know a passion of wanting to do something. And I see that he picked up. You know, he wanted to save. You know, uh, what is it? The uh, caterpillars, not caterpillars. Yeah, mine are right. butterflies. I hate bugs. Yeah, butterflies. I hate yeah. bugs. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it, you know it was one of those moments that I could relate to where you know, something so small like that you know uh, you find that 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 something that I think you lose in combat, which is uh, which is love. You lose a lot of love, you know, and how to shut off that you know um, when you get home to your significant other or your kids and you don't know how to express that emotion called love because you've seen a lot of other things opposite of love. So to, so to get back as something small as you know, raising a caterpillar, that takes love. And for me, it was plants. Uh, I got into pottery and or, you know, growing plants in the backyard and, and stuff like that, and, and trimming the plants. I got into, uh, it was just a peaceful, I guess, a sinful moment for me. And it's something that you do have to express some uh, you know, compassion towards. You're taking care of something, which means, you know, somewhat love it to some extent and rekindling that that spark of love was you know as small as it may have been you know I think was really impactful on, on my life and you know his as well it goes back to that purpose yep, piece yeah. too so for me the the father Keating was the most powerful piece where he talked to him about allowing him to forgive himself mm -hmm. and to forgive God because it just you know I you can't help but think about, you know, how could God let this happen? But you realize it's the free will of I man. Was say that, yeah. So, you know, when you look at it from that lens, but then being able to forgive yourself, I mean, that, that's just powerful. Mm -hmm.
and that's that's not just uh, combat. It could be, you know, in, in my case, having a, a failed marriage, being able to forgive myself for that. So it, that that was powerful for me. Yeah. Uh, if any of you all want to jump in, I'm happy to to cede the floor, but, but I can also continue the conversation with the with the crew. You have to stand up over there. I can't see anything. <laughs> I <know. laughs> uh, Andrew, I was please. Uh, I might rephrase your question. Go for Instead it. of asking if it's a disease, mm -hmm. I might ask, is to suffer a moral injury um, to be human? Mm -hmm. You might wonder, those that face the extensive combat and don't suffer moral injury, maybe mm -hmm. we need to worry about them in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your distress seems to be the distress from moral injury seems to be perhaps maybe is equivalent to the degree to which someone can um, does have the capacity for compassion and empathy um, once they're able to be in, in touch with it. It's the be seems like it's the beginning of being back in touch with it. So, would this make them better warriors if they're if they're susceptible to that? It might almost be a crush. I can't. That's not my area. I would say, like, <laughs> in the military, for, you know, you, you're all, and especially, I'm not sure, you're in Marine Corps, right? Or Marine Corps? So in the Marines, you're not allowed to say I or me, what is it? So you automatically, you neglect yourself from basic training throughout your military career. You're told to, there is no you. It's all about everyone else or your brothers. And it was the same way in the military as well. And refinding yourself once you get out, I mean, you've ignored yourself for six, four, 20 plus years that, you know, to get out of the military and automatically say, okay, I'm me again, I, I think you forget, you know, who you really are because you've been conditioned for so long to, you know, realize that there is no you. Hmm. I, think, I think also um, what's interesting is that it's, and the way I've explained it to a lot of the clients that we work with, or that I work with, it is imagine being in a room with absolutely no sound and by the way, you don't have tinnitus anymore, um, so you're not worried about that. But there's a room with no sound, it's completely soundproof. And then one of these days you hear a stereo at like level, like at volume level like one or two. What does that sound like? And of, of course, the obvious answer is, well, I, I, it would seem like it would be blasting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of the expression of what emotion feels like once we've shut it off. And when it starts, when, we, when it starts to creep out, I so said, "Wait a second! No, this emotion crap is no. That's for that's not for service members. I have trained to shut this off. No. So any emotion that comes up, um, and of course, always gets blanketed by anger, right? Well, not always, but but a lot of the times get blanketed gets blanketed by anger. The tip of that iceberg. Um, so it, in essence, it's, I think it's it takes a little bit of time because it took time to be able to shut the emotion off. Yeah. So it takes time to be able to turn it back on nice and slow. Mm -hmm. Just to start it as a, as a drip first and then slowly and slowly and slowly we can let the water run a little bit more and then a little bit more and we can turn the hot water on and, and we can get it lukewarm and then one of these days we just shut the cold off and now it's burning hot and I can stand it and tolerate it. Right? Um, when, you know, but you know, that it's it really depends on the person too. So I remember um, uh, in 2003, I was um, I was a working photojournalist in in and I spent a very short time in Iraq, um, not attached to an army unit or a military unit. And um, this reporter that I was working with, a guy named uh, uh, Tim. Oh God, I can't remember his name right now. Anyway, um, reporter I was working with is a police reporter from the Wichita Eagle. And so he fell back on his laurels, and he said, Look, let's go just go do a basic cop story. So we went to the morgue. We wanted to identify how many people since March 19th died of gun violence. Real basic stuff, right? Walk into the morgue. He's talking to the stuff, looking at the log books, and I walked into the um, autopsy suite, and there were two, three, five, like seven or eight tables, and all, the, uh, all males are laying on the tables, um, uh, deceased, and every one of them was, was uh, killed by gun violence. And not by American gun violence, by Iraqi gun violence. Um, and the one that's, that stuck with me, two that stuck with me actually, is a 12-year-old boy um, that was laying down and he had been hit by 
by gunfire, whatever it was. And there was, um, and this is something that was that talked about in the film. There was a police commander um, that was hit in a drive-by. He and, and um, his partner, uh, and their car was raked by gunfire, and he had uh, 10, 12 holes in it, and just laying there, you know, on the slab. The twelve-year-old stuck with me, not not to this like deep gut-wrenching thing, but it's like, you know, how cruel can we be, right? What if if this is a society that we want to protect? Why do we want to protect this? You know? So there's I mean there's a lot more stuff that comes up. Um, but yeah, anyway, it goes back. One of the things that goes back for me is to be able to kind of like slowly turn that emotion back on and learn how to tolerate. How to tolerate it more, and then learn how to tolerate it more. Um, what do you all think, or anybody out here? What do you all think families should know about the challenges of reintegrating warriors when they come home? We're talking a lot about the challenges here. Is there anything families should know, or should prepare to know, about all this? I think I, um, my name is. Out and uh, you know, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a four year army vet. I was never deployed, but uh, you know, I can kind of like understand where all of my fellow um, veterans that, that, that I've seen come back uh, are coming from. And uh, you know, one thing I can say is uh, really patience. You know, family members uh, really have to be patient because uh, it's not really, it's not easy. I can imagine it's not easy for all my fellow uh, comrades, you know, coming back from, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, the, coming back from, you know, uh, life range, you know, or, or war, you know, uh, kind of like come back to, you know, I, I, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so emotional because, you know, of, you know, of the, of the screening, I, I can't even, I can't even find my words, but, you know, one thing I can, I, I can imagine is, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult for these guys, and patience and compassion is really the only thing that, uh, you know, family members can do for, for these soldiers and, uh, you know, and the service members. If I could just add to that, I'm Chris of the Army that served in Iraq, and I got home um, I demobilized a week before Christmas and I got back to my home on Christmas Eve and uh, the patience thing is, is critical to families because I remember my family was so excited to see me, it's Christmas it's awesome, big Irish Catholic family let's all party and there's Chris kind of sitting in the corner like what the hell is going on right now um, and they just didn't I remember walking into my uncle's kitchen and all the uncles, my father, are like whispering, and they're talking about me. Like I'm not an idiot. I hate that. Um, <laughs> I hate that. I know where you're going with that. Yeah. You know, they I mean, used to annoy me really bad. Whispers, yeah, man. and um, and uh, I overheard some. I think with my father, like, oh, just killed. See, I think my father said, just kills me to see him like this or something like that. I'm like that. I've been home for like 24 hours. So just the patience is 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 critical for for families to to. Kind of go through that process with the veteran when, when they come home. Yeah. Put that decompression time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't make any important decisions. In right. The first 90 days, 180 days, whatever it takes. Buy a car yeah. or a fire truck. <laughs> <laughs> does the film's suggestion of uh, mindfulness and breath work, does that? resonate with any of y'all as being something that might seem promising as a way of dealing with, or at least beginning to deal with some of the challenges that people face? I think the fact that it's becoming more of a talked about topic is, you know, I guess essentially helping those who don't even want to talk about it. That we've become so type A that, you know, talking about it, is, it, it it's kind of scary at some times or some points for some people, but Having videos like this and having discussions like this, it you know causes an awareness to something that is not really talked about, not amongst not just amongst veterans, but in the military as well. The military has to recognize as well that you know there is a, a problem, an epidemic, you know, to some point or some degree. We've we're, you know we're losing tens of thousands of you know so innocent lives from you know suicide, 
and there's a problem there. And yeah, it's being addressed, but I think it's becoming like, um, there was a point in time where the topic became almost to the point where it was taboo to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to bring up something to a veteran because you think that he may or may not be crazy or classified as crazy. And, you know, all the movies that are portrayed in Hollywood now, and I've worked on a few where, you know, this guy's going to go shoot up a liquor store, you know, because he got back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So people tend to shy away. But opening up these conversations and, and getting a chance to see the, the journey that people go through, um, you know, when it comes to PTSD or coming from overseas, it kind of sheds a little bit of light of like, hey, these guys aren't crazy. They just need time or, you know, have to be patient. And, you know, some scars, you know, uh, heal faster than others, you know. Right. Fall down and scrape your knee, it might heal in a week, but if you get shot, you know, it might take a while. So. Yeah, and there isn't one remedy to fix everyone, and I think the military just has to be more open to the fact that we need to try different types of healing strategies depending on what the wound is and how mm-hmm. deep it is. And it's mm-hmm. the meditation, the mindfulness was one aspect of that that looks like it has a, a lot of potential and mm-hmm. promise. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the science behind it is, I think, nearly irrefutable that that it does. Um, you know, it teaches you to regulate your frontal cortex, and we know that you know the the fear, the the panic, the hyper arousal is all in your amygdala, that deep portion of the kind of the primitive portion of your brain that is aroused. That that's your flight or fight response. Mm-hmm. And the more healthy, uh, the stronger the connection is between your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala, either through number of connections or the strength of those connections, the better your kind of reasoning brain can tamp down that primal part of your brain and say, that loud noise, you know, that was a chair falling and I'm okay instead of allowing your body to go into that full uh, flight, uh, fight or flight mode. So <laughs> the work that Richard Davidson is doing in, uh, um, at the University of Wisconsin actually with a lot of vets as well um, is um, another, um, I couldn't identify the man in the, man in the film, but uh, I've seen um, e- examples other examples of working with vets where the mindfulness meditation with breath um, uh, Bessel van der Kirk who's a prominent uh, psychiatrist psychologist? psychiatrist? psychiatrist, psychiatrist, psychiatrist. who's done um, a tremendous amount of, of work to help our understanding of trauma talks a lot about reintegrating the breath with the body mm-hmm. and that that is one of the fundamental challenges for overcoming trauma and uh, so the, you know, his foundational work and then the neuroscience research behind this is, is just showing that it's very, it's cheap and it's um, very, very effective. Not a lot of drug uh, interaction stuff going on there either. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Although some people may need pharmacol- pharmacological intervention yeah, so, ex- so they can get to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, You're so I would never, absolutely. I would never um, dismiss that. But. Mm-hmm. We have time for maybe just one or two more comments. You all were talking about patience and compassion among families. Do you think that would translate well into communities? So when communities are welcoming service members home, is that something that they should cultivate? Or are there other strategies or virtues that they might want to bring to the table when attempting to provide sort of welcoming return for the people who served our country? Absolutely. I, I really think that, you know, um, we come from a different culture, you know, like uh, in the military we pretty much train to have like a focused mindset, you know, like train to execute, train to kill, like muscle memory, you know, you need to do this and, you know, through, uh, I mean, after like um, a couple of repetitions you develop this kind of, um, you know, muscle memory. And uh, coming from this culture and transition, uh, transitioning into the you know civil uh, civilian uh, civilian life, you know, it's kind of tough or it's kind of hard for us to kind of like readjust to all the realities. Like you said, you know, paying your bills, you know, um, taking care of all different aspects of the civilian life. And uh, I I think that 
it'll be really helpful for you know the community, you know the civilian community to pretty much uh, keep that in mind as you know as well, because we're coming from a totally different world, and uh, that's pretty much after speaking with a lot of veterans, uh, the 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 obstacle, the main obstacle we're facing as veterans. So I, I heard National Guard over there earlier, and I, I just want to mention that our Guardsmen and Reservists have a, an even more difficult time integrating because they don't come back to an active duty base where they have that support around them mm -hmm. with people that understand. They, they reintegrate into their hometown USA, and then creating that awareness not just with the spouse but also with the community and sometimes the employers who don't understand because now they're coming back and, and they're going back to work in a, you know, less than 30 days. And they may not see those soldiers that they went to war with until the next drill, which probably has been postponed for a month to give them a break, when really they needed that time to come back together again sooner. So it, it's particularly critical that we educate our communities for our reservists and National Guards men and women. I like one thing that General just said. She said integrate. Mm -hmm. I read uh, an article a few years ago uh, by a very angry um, combatant who had just come home and wrote this article about you you don't reintegrate because that that says that I'm coming back to what I left. I'm not the way I was when I left, and you're not the way you were when I left. And you're very different now. You can't reintegrate. You're integrating into something different. You're taking something different yourself and shoving it into what everybody expects and thinks is the same. So you don't really reintegrate. You're integrating, and and it goes back to what this, this uh, your comments were great back to patients, that community, whether the community is your family, your community, your town, or Georgia State, in this case we have a big community here that can be broken down into small communities, but be educated, a little more educated, but patient, be patient, because they're not reintegrating, they're integrating into something very foreign. And that was one of the big things for me coming back was the change of either furniture that was moved around, uh, my wall locker, you know, messed with or just not the way I left it. The music was different and that really irritated me because I felt like an outcast at that point. You know, you go out to a bar or a club and everyone's, you know, singing this one song that you didn't, you know, know nothing about and you feel like that outcast again. And all you want to do is fit in and feel normal, but you've missed so much of the civilian lifestyle, uh, what's going on back here that, you know, it, you become the outcast and you kind of shell away. That was my go-to, was to shell away. I'm already the outcast, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm already here, so kind of just let the people do what they do, and I'll sit back and observe, and that's what I've always been known to do. But, you know, of course, over time, things have gotten better, but the amount of change that happens over the course of deployment, and that soldier, all he wants, or, you know, she wants to, you know, when they get back home, is to see nothing changed. It's that, you know, your families have, grown and, and your daughter or your child has you know gotten bigger and uh, things at work aren't the same they're, you know they're different but when you left it all you want to do is come back and just you know pick up where you left off and not having that is one of the you know big things I think a lot of people face as well and, and, and it's even harder for families because now that spouse has been doing all those mm -hmm. things that you did when you were there and when yep. you come back she may not want to let yeah. you balance the checkbook or manage the finances or it's maybe be mowing the yard, I, you know. So I and, and think about it from a woman's perspective too. Yeah. When she comes back home, you come back as this muscle memory kind of person, but now you've got to be mommy again and wife. Mm -hmm. You know, that, talk about how difficult that can be to be that, that soft woman again after you've had to see some ugly things and, and do some things that perhaps created moral injury for you as well. So yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. I, I don't think people even comprehend what our service members go through. Whether they deploy or not, it still changes you. It is definitely a life-changing experience to serve your country. Well, with that, uh, we will draw our panel to a close. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, and thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Choked up twice. Yeah, that was pretty rough.